I think some business owners, uh, what they what they should not do, and I've I've seen this myself. They don't listen to their customers. Right. They they are of the mindset that well, I'm going to tell my customer what he wants and mm. needs, and my response is he'll never listen to you mm-hmm. because he knows what he wants better than you know what he wants. Right. We're here for another episode of Forging the Future, and our guest today is Tassos Katsaunas. Thanks for coming, Tassos. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me, Chris. Did I get that one? Did I nail it? You nailed it. <laughs> nailed it. Uh, otherwise known as the bread man. I got to say that at least up front, right? Yeah. So yeah. Uh, why do they call you that, Tassos? Tell us a little bit about your story. Yeah. So um, I, uh, I own a artisan commercial bakery here in Houston. And uh, it's a unique story because it started out of my home kitchen um, with with no real ambition to get to where I am now. Mm. Um, I'd spent 22 of years of my career, professional career, working in management consulting, strategy consulting, mm. a lot of SAP implementation. So the mm. technology space was very familiar. I was very familiar with it, um, but I never enjoyed it. Um, and so <clears throat> as a kid... My parents are Greek immigrants. Mm-hmm. So when they immigrated here in the 70s, um, out of necessity, my mom made bread for the house for our family two, three times a week. And the reason for that is Wonder Bread, for example, didn't exist in Greece, mm-hmm. but it was very, it was everywhere here in the grocery stores. So mm-hmm. the rustic artisan bread that my parents were accustomed to in the village, um, if you wanted it, it was expensive. My mother just said, well, we, we can't afford that. We're just going to make it. So I learned how to make bread at at about 10 years old. I was attached to my mother in the kitchen and picked it back up again in 2017 to really escape the stress and dare I say the misery of my career at the time. Uh, And I was uh, worked 100 percent remotely at that time. So I had the capability of of literally scheduling my Zoom calls around my baking schedule and vice versa. Mm. So I, I became obsessed with it very quickly. I wanted to uh, perfect the, the loaf, which, you know, is ironic or and not ironic, but it, it's more counterintuitive because what makes artisan bread so sexy is the imperfections. Mm. Um, so I, sexy I guess sexy bread, huh? sexy okay. bread. All yeah. Right. It's the only time that blisters should ever be sexy <laughs> on a sourdough. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we, uh, we started baking. I say we, I started baking out of the, <clears throat> the house and, um, people started asking to buy it. And I thought, that was a little crazy mm. because I loved making it. And to me, I just wanted people to enjoy it. So yeah. I, I wanted to give it to them out of just the labor of love. And um, they became adamant about it. And so I started, I caved and I started selling loaves of bread for $10 a loaf. which Just to family and friends. Family yeah. and friends, school, you know, my, the teachers at my kids' school, things mm-hmm. like that. And shortly thereafter, I'd say a couple of months into it, I, I started getting inquiries um, from local restaurants, hotels um, for samples for food service mm. use, and which is obviously commercial. Mm. So that's when we realized, okay, maybe this is something um, we should look into. And so we did some more, you know, looking into it, deep diving into it, having some serious conversations. My wife was very supportive about it because she knew how miserable, I guess you could say I was in my career. Mm -hmm. And I had been looking for a change, not knowing what that change was. And I still believe to this day that the change found me. And so we made a conscious decision to resign from my career. At that time I was with Accenture. Mm -hmm. I left the firm and they were proud of me, as they put it, Mm -hmm. uh, that I was willing to take this risk. And they told me that they hope they never see me again, but if they (laughs) Do the door was open, which That's I thought nice. was awesome. I had a similar thing when I was working down at IBM, where as another reason why I left. I want to, you know, because I think this is important when founders are venturing off on their own. It mm-hmm. is, it is nice that you're leaving somewhere that says, "Well, the door is open." Like yeah. I could always, I was an intern at IBM, it wasn't a real job, but I mean, I was there for a couple of years, and it was super fun job. But um, you know, when when I uh, when I left, they're like, "Hey." you know, go off, do what you do, whatever, and come back, you know, if it doesn't work out. Yeah. 
it makes you feel more comfortable knowing mm-hmm. that you have that as a fallback, mm-hmm. although you have no intention to fall back because yeah. you've got it in your mindset that you're an entrepreneur and this right. is what I want to do. I want to carve my own path. Mm-hmm. But again, when you're married with three children and you've yeah. got responsibilities, yes. the fallback is there and it's comfortable, mm-hmm. right? So it, it made it a lot easier for me because, you know, I, I know I know a lot of entrepreneurs and I've had an opportunity to meet quite a few, especially through soft tech. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know that every single one of them have probably had moments where they were terrified, <clears throat> right? Because of whatever circumstance that was causing that feeling. But it was still nice to know that I've been doing this for 22 years. Mm -hmm. I could easily go back to it. The money was good. The experience wasn't, but you could support your family on it, right? Um, So we uh, resigned from Accenture in July of 2017. Harvey happened. Mm -hmm. So when we started planning and, uh, you know, and searching a new facility, uh, that was obviously delayed. We didn't get open until July of 2018, but in that interim, you know, I put my little consulting hat on and I thought I'm venturing into a completely foreign territory, mm-hmm. right? I'm, I'm not a, to say that my family has owned a bakery for 40 years and I wanted to go <laughs> carve my own path by opening my own bakery. Right. This is, uh, you know, I used to sell theories, mm-hmm. right? Um, and, uh, and now here I am, you know, actually going to be manufacturing a product and everything that comes with that, which was completely foreign to me. So it was important for me to understand what exactly was needed mm-hmm. in the market to to ensure that we are going to have a successful launch of this business. And how did you figure that out? Well, um, again, I, I put my consulting hat on and I went out and I, I sat down first, wrote a business model and a business plan. And then I realized, okay, I'm my goal is to to produce a artisan product, <clears throat> a true artisan product, right? A product that's not filled with chemicals and things you can't pronounce, a sourdough that is water, flour, and salt, and that's it. So I thought, who wants to buy that product? Mm-hmm. And I'm thinking commercially now, I'm not thinking, you know, I'm thinking B2B, not B2C. And I thought, look, we're in Houston, Texas. There's 10,000 restaurants in Houston. We have James Beard winning chefs here. We have We have chefs that will pay for an artisan product because they have an application for it. So let's go talk to them. So I went out and I interviewed, um, I collected data from chefs and I wanted to understand where are the gaps? Mm -hmm. What are your must haves? What are your nice to haves? What are you lacking currently with your current supplier? Um, What do you want to seek out of a new supplier? And the consensus all came back. Uh, The data was very clear. It was consistency, quality, um, in terms of artisanship, and then customer service, mm-hmm. their service was lacking. And all of those three combined it, it, you know, and I researched other bakeries in the market and I realized there was a gap and there was good timing and a good opportunity for us to come in and give the people, if you will, in this context, what they wanted. Which is interesting because <clears throat> if you had asked me whether the world needed another bread company or yeah. do you think the restaurant business has bread figured out? Yeah. I would have said, well, yeah, of course. You yeah. know, why would why would I ever start a bread company? Sure. Uh, when you know, it's when <laughs> you know every restaurant you go to puts the bread basket down. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But I think the point is just what you made is you identified the gaps and that and that it wasn't really figured out. Right. In a lot of cases. Right? Yeah. I think, I think there was, there was bread that existed in the market, but it was it at the standard that they wanted. Mm-hmm. And I think they were forced into a lack of options, if you will, mm-hmm. which is why they were using who they were using. Sub quality. So, and- yeah. I mean, look, you, everyone had the same <clears throat> bread. Or whatever. Well, there's some of that and <laughs> you know, Cisco bread, here you go. <laughs> <laughs> there was a, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of people that the everyday consumer that goes out to a restaurant, shockingly, how much they judge a menu in a restaurant by the bread that is really? served. Yeah. And, um, and so I hear that quite often is I don't like to go there cause the bread is poor. Mm. And I thought, wow, that, you know, of all the items that you're you're enjoying off that menu. Mm. And, and when you think about how important bread is to just the everyday life of the community, right? I mean, it's it's a core, it's a standard in everyone's pantry, mm-hmm. right? It's a standard on most menus. Although it's very commercialized, at least at home. I mean, I remember when I first started going to um, 
um, Belarus actually. And I was of course by myself and I'm basically, you know, a bachelor there. Right. You know, right. and I go to the store and I'm like, Oh, I'm just going to buy a, I'm going to buy some sliced bread and some peanut butter and some jelly and, ah. you know, some, uh, cans of soup and canned stuff. And I go to the store and none of that's there. Yeah. There's no sliced bread. There's like loaves yeah. or there's no canned soup because, Hey, if you're going to make soup, there's the tomatoes and there's the vegetables exactly. and there's uh, the stuff you put in it. Exactly. Right. And there's no such thing as peanut butter even. Right. No, you know, no, so not. it's like, what, what are you even talking about? So, um, but it is a big part of, uh, it, in Europe, especially, which mm -hmm. is where your family came from. Right. And, um, but uh, I think people are more exposed to what bread can be in the restaurants, right? Because at home, yeah. yeah, it's Wonder Bread, sliced bread, whatever, right? You know, yeah. in a lot of cases, yeah. unless yeah. you're making it yourself. Correct. Um, and yeah. I think now you're finding um, the commonality now in today's climate, let's say, from a, a food standpoint, <clears throat> excuse me, most people care about now what they're feeding their families mm -hmm. and they're reading more ingredient statements and ingre ingredient labels more and more. So, you know, I get I, I often asked by the consumer because we retail with Whole Foods, so you can go to Whole Foods and find our bread. Mm -hmm. And I will get emails, phone calls to the bakery just from someone who went, who's actually standing at the bread wall in a bakery at Whole Foods asking me questions about the grains that we use. Mm -hmm. Where do we source them? Is there anything in here that I need to be aware of? And it's Whole Foods and they have very clear standards on mm -hmm. what you can and can't put in a product. Uh, and even then it's very evident that people care that much that they're willing to go the extra mile to pick up the phone and call the manufacturer directly because they know it's a local person mm -hmm. and, and make sure that what they're feeding their families is meeting their standards, That's which is my personal standard too, mm -hmm. which is why I prefer that path of artisan over just commercialized bread. Right. Now, I started soft tech out of my house, okay? Yeah. And um, people ask me how work changed for me over COVID. And I'm like, well, I think the world caught up to me. You know, it's 25 years ago. I decided not to do brick and mortar. I put in a high-speed internet line. I had a, built out my network and computers and I had a real office there, but I was in my house and I had to kind of hide it, right? Yeah. You know, I didn't, you know, lie about it, but I didn't promote it because back then if you were uh, not brick and mortar, then you weren't a real business. And I had some large deals on the table, like companies like Disney. And I'm like, what did they find out? I'm just a guy in my house, you know, and we homeschool our five kids. And, you know, so back then it was just, if the doorbell rang, I had to, you know, be fast at the mute button because yeah. they'd be like, wait, are you at home? Was that a dog? What's going on? And now everyone promotes their dog and cat, right? You know, yeah. Here's your dog, here's your cat, here's your kid, how cute, you know? Yeah. So I'm glad the stigma has been removed, but I didn't have the challenge that, that, that you do. Uh, yeah. You, like the first um, engagement you got with the restaurant, um, you were still making the bread at home, right? Uh, no. Oh, you weren't. Uh, you had to get an office to do it. We had, we had to get, so... You know, it, that's a that's a great question. So mm. commercially speaking, it's illegal to do that uh, to service. I was commercial. wondering, I thought, you know, yeah. how do you pass <laughs> those kinds of requirements yeah. about, Correct. okay, people are eating this now, you know, right. so be better not to kill anybody. Right? Yeah. You know? So Texas cottage <laughs> laws. Or make them sick. Anyway. No, yeah. <laughs> Texas cottage laws state that you can sell retail out of your house, mm -hmm. but commercially you can't. Mm -hmm. So you have to have some sort of offsite, you know, facility. So we moved out of you know, in the temporary time frame between we could get our, our old bakery now that we're in the new one, but in the old bakery, um, opened up in July of 18, mm -hmm. I went to a small shared commissary kitchen where I rented a 10 foot by 10 foot room mm -hmm. and I mixed and proofed and shaped and did everything in there and then took them down the hall to a shared kitchen where I had to compete with a pie lady mm -hmm. to bake, you know, what I had access to at the time was only 16 breads I could bake at once. What does a pie lady bread man fight look like? I don't know. You know, <laughs> it was, uh, interesting. Interesting, especially around the holidays. <laughs> uh, so uh, there was a couple of clashes there. Uh, there was a, I never knew how much I hated meringue until I saw this lady <laughs> making meringue pies yeah, and getting funny. in my way. But, but, you know, the challenges were I had an, a, uh, a, an environment I couldn't control. Mm -hmm. Right. And the vital, you know, my product proofs and it rises and it moves with or without you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can overproof a product and lose it mm -hmm. and you can't just turn around and make another batch. That's mm -hmm. another 24 hours. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> it was, it behooved us to get this place open, mm -hmm. right? Because then I could use proper equipment, proper technology, um, you know, a controlled environment 
uh, no one getting in my way of producing my product at the time frame because everything to us is down by the minute. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but again, to your point, that little 10 foot by 10 foot room working out of a commissary is similar to you having the fear or, you know, uh, uh, the thought process of, gosh, I hope Disney doesn't hope, you know, that I'm working out of my house <laughs> yeah. because my thing was, gosh, you know, the Weston hotel downtown has mm-hmm. no idea that I'm baking all these loaves of bread for their hotel out mm-hmm. of this tiny 10 foot by 10 foot room mm-hmm. where I have to butt heads with a pie lady over the oven capacity. Why right? do you think they didn't do like, uh, I remember when I, I, I did have an actual office. I pivoted into soft tech and I said, yeah. made the decision to run, to, to have the, the business You're at right. home. Yep. But I, um, I, uh, uh, as soon as I did that, of course, Compaq came and did a site visit. <laughs> I'm like, really? Now you're going to come? Because no one would come by my physical space. It was my previous company. That's why I said, sure. I did found soft tech out of the house. And as soon yeah. as I did that, they came out, you know, <laughs> but luckily they said, oh, well, because it was not like a computer in the corner of my bedroom or something, it was a, a it was a, you know, desks and computers and a network yeah. and a T1 line and all that. And you're like, oh, this is great. You know, oh, so T1 this is great. Line. So this was, uh. At least I passed that test, but um, it's interesting that they didn't actually come out and do any kind of audit of your facility, right? They, there's yeah. a lot of trust involved in that. Yes, right? and you know what? The 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 larger the customer that we started um, engaging, mm-hmm. it was the, you know they were inviting themselves over. Hey, we want to come see your facility. Oh, when they can did. we come by? Okay. Well, once, once we they got, got to a bigger level, once we right? got to a bigger level, like mm-hmm. I think the first customer that really wanted to come visit us was Sweetgreen, which mm-hmm. is actually located near us here where we're, mm-hmm. where we're doing this. And from. was that in the shared kitchen that they did that or after you got a, your first uh, It facility? was after I got into the new facility, okay. but and I How had big was that facility that you 5, had? 5,000 square feet. Okay. Yeah. Which I thought would last us for the entire duration of the five-year lease we had signed, mm-hmm. but it, it only lasted two and a half years. <laughs> <laughs> half the time. <laughs> half right. the time. We mm-hmm. grew it pretty quickly, but but, you know, their people, their culinary team flew out from their headquarters in L.A. Mm. And they, you know, say, like, hey, we're going to be there next week. Are you available? And I thought, <laughs> uh, oh, my gosh, like, uh, I, I, I don't even know what this means. And yeah. did you have to raise money? I imagine there's a lot of equipment involved. Right? I mean, I know yeah. you're going artisan and I assume you're not rolling the hand rolling all that bread yourself. No, right? you know what? That's a great question. So, yeah, we we've had to we've had a few rounds of capital mm. raises, um, mm. you know, the 5000 square foot space. um, had required, obviously we had a starting point with the budget that we had in mind, which was all, you know, from me and, and, and my wife, mm-hmm. um, but Self, as self-funded. self-funded mm-hmm. Yeah. So as we grew and we realized, you know, this equipment, we need better efficiency in place and, and more capacity, oven capacity and whatnot. Then we started realizing, you know, industrial baking equipment is incredibly expensive. I have mm-hmm. three production lines to give an example now in my current facility and the most inexpensive one is one hundred and seventy-seven thousand dollars. That's crazy. The most expensive one is three hundred and sixty-five thousand wow. dollars. Right, and that doesn't count ovens, mixers, proofers, packaging equipment, slicing, freezing. And you had to get loans for that, or you had to get raised <clears throat> capital for we, it. We we raised capital for that. We mm-hmm. we um, we took on financial partners, mm-hmm. and um, and it was an experience for me because obviously when you work in in tech or consulting or anything like that, you're familiar with the process of mm-hmm. capital raising and, and such, but mm-hmm. until you're actually in that and doing it yourself for mm-hmm. your own gain and venture, mm-hmm. um, it, it's a full-time job right. and it's incredibly stressful mm-hmm. because you know, you need the money. It's, right. it's not a want the money, but you need the money because you have something you're trying to achieve or fill a PO or you know, take on a new client. Money um, is the lifeblood of any business. Absolutely. A hundred percent is, it's very synonymous with bread in my Mm. opinion. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, exactly. So you went and raised money. Um, and, uh, you've been through a few rounds now. Yeah, we've been through a few, we've had three rounds of capital raises. Mm -hmm. Um, this last, when we expanded into the new facility, which was at towards the tail end of last year. And how big is that one? 40,000 square feet. That's (laughs) crazy. It it is crazy. (laughs) It keeps me up at night. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, we, that was a, f- a four and a half million dollar project. Wow. And that was, uh, half of that was through capital raise. The other mm. half was uh, the equipment mostly was financed through equipment leasing through the bank, mm. but like construction operating capital, mm-hmm. you know, we had to, um, double our workforce as soon as we moved in 
because 5,000 square feet, we had 12 employees. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, we had 18 employees. Going into the new one, now we have 43. Wow. Right? And so- Mm -hmm. How many loaves of bread are you up to now? Uh, or what's the quantity? And what, what do you measure it in? Yeah. But, uh, so I think today we produce 12,000 units. Um, and now we have a truckload of bread going out every week mm-hmm. um, to one particular client, which is about uh, 1,200 cases or 12,000 units wow. um, that goes out every Friday. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, we have um, the p- facility has the capability of producing um, up to 135,000 units a day. Mm, okay. Yeah. So you have yeah, some capacity. To- <laughs> we have a little bit of capacity to go, right? I mean, yeah. we've, we've designed it for scale in mind. Mm. Um, and you know, we, we had to, I learned the first time that, uh, don't underbuild, mm-hmm. you know, it's okay to overbuild a little bit because, you know, the, the, the company told me where it wanted to go. Mm-hmm. Right. I, I directed it as much as I could, but the the timing of coming in, that need, the demand, and the brand that we were building, mm-hmm. um, it, it became obvious that we need to be very mindful about how we execute this next facility. Yeah, that's a good point, I think, for any uh, startup and any founder that uh, I, I see that happen quite a bit where, oh, we're going to get an office and yeah. they get like a small lease and they sign a, you know, three, four, five year lease. And then within a year or two, you need more room and now yeah. you're constrained and you need to maybe move or you're, yeah. like, you're, you're divided and, you know, to try to at least project your growth and not necessarily say, well, I need to sign a lease for where, where I'm going to be in five years, but where am I going to be in a, in a, in a year or two? Yeah. And so I, you, you're actually paying a little more. So you have that expansion capability, mm-hmm. right? And you might get more and more crowded until then you need to, you know, split like an amoeba or whatever and <laughs> uh, go to that next phase. But, um, well, I yeah. think, I think it's also similar to, ensuring that you're properly funded, Mm, right? With that in mind. Mm -hmm. Um, And I found myself in one scenario where I was not, I was underfunded Mm -hmm. and it was panic mode because Mm -hmm. you had the business, but you were growing so quickly that you couldn't keep up, right? right? From a capital perspective. Well, I mean, businesses, they're, um, they're cash hogs, whether you're, you're dying or you're growing. It never really seems to be like an in-between, right? You know? And so you might get a few times where you're like, okay, we're just going to hum along at this level. And, but you know, once you start trying to grow again, uh, then, then you need the money. And yeah. I wanted to touch on that a little bit because um, I know you know Carrie from Carrie Colbert from Curate Capital. Oh yeah, I love Carrie. Right, and um, one thing I find fascinating is just you know how collisions and connections are made, mm-hmm. and they're often not in the places you think that you would make those connections. Right. right? So um, talk a little bit about how you met Carrie, and then maybe how you ended up meeting. Um, Billy, who's the head of our venture studio Mm -hmm. and, you know, kind of tell that story. So Carrie and I were featured, um, and this was when I first started the bakery Mm -hmm. and she was, um, uh, doing like a social media platform, uh, type, uh, thing. And we were, her business similarly grew out of her house. Mm -hmm. Um, at that time, this was prior to Curate Capital. She had a venture fund. Oh, well, she, she launched a venture fund. Correct. Mm -hmm. Launched a venture fund. Mm -hmm. And, and she had, um, it was heavily started through social media. Well, uh, one of the local affiliates here, news channels wanted to, was doing a news story, a piece on small businesses that were launched through social media. Mm, mm-hmm. And so um, they contacted me and they wanted to, they came to my house and interviewed me in my home kitchen where the bakery started. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, they did this whole piece. Well, as it aired, I'm watching it and I see Carrie that was on the P I think she was before me on the piece. I came after and mm-hmm. we connected through social, we followed each other. And then we just exchanged a few messages mm-hmm. and we said, you know what? I, I think it's great what you're doing. Um, I'd love to pick your brain on a few things. We immediately kind of connected as friends and, you know, we've formed a really great relationship over these last five years. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, and I think what she's doing now is incredible work. And I love that she's focusing on women owned businesses. I think there's, there's a lot of great things that come out of that. And I think more of that needs, needs to happen, mm-hmm. um, in the market, uh, and in the industry. Um, but, um, it's funny because then, you know, Billy and I, our daughters, like his oldest daughter and my oldest daughter are best friends. Mm-hmm. Um, and we met through just the preschool in the neighborhood where we both live. 
that our kids attended when they moved here from, I think he was coming in from Dubai with his family at the mm -hmm. time. And, uh, and our kids immediately connected. And as you know, a lot, as you get older and you have children, you start having friends based on, are the parents, your friends become the parents, <laughs> right? Right. Of, the of, connection the is of the your kids. kids. Yeah. yeah. Your kids are now the connections. <laughs> right. And so we met Billy and, and, and his wife, Christina, and we immediately connected with them. They didn't have anyone else here in Houston. So we immediately brought them in as like family and they were spending holidays with us. And, mm -hmm. and Billy was, you know, when I first started raising capital for the bakery, Billy was an integral piece to that. And he was um, such a tremendous help because he understood that world. Obviously, mm -hmm. that's the world that he came from. And mm -hmm. I had no experience with that. So Billy was really a great friend, has become a great friend over the years, one of my closest friends, and helped me Oh, with just about every capital raise we've done. So now that he's with soft tech mm -hmm. and he's responsible for the venture studio, um, I thought immediately, you know, he reaches out to me, goes, Hey, we're having these events and we're inviting investors. If you know anyone. And, you know, my wife and I have a pretty vast network here in Houston. Um, and, you know, I've been very fortunate to have Billy's assistance, just from as from a friend, you know, a friend helping a friend. Yeah, there was no professional part of that, right? It was Zero. just friends. It was yeah. just a friend helping someone, you know, his buddy out. And mm -hmm. yeah, he's he's never asked for anything more, um, which is, you know, obviously you, you, you want to love someone for that because mm -hmm. they genuinely have your best interest at that right. point. And um, and so I said, hey, I may know a couple of people. So I I, I brought in Carrie mm -hmm. and um, and I invited um uh, Craig uh, Chikanti, who's also now a board member of mine, mm. an investor in the bakery, now I believe is involved. With, yeah, I think he's with, an LP now. He's yeah. an LP now, mm -hmm. right? So in the fund, yeah, fun, yeah. And then uh, Jumana Partners, exactly. <clears throat> Jumana's um, director, who runs that fund, was my son's soccer coach. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you know, I never knew what Chris Martin did uh, yeah. uh, until we caught up on the soccer field one mm -hmm. day, and. Um, he had interest actually in investing in the bakery. And I just said, you know what? I think I know the right fit for y'all. And I introduced him to Billy. Right. And so it's all very, you know, I don't want to say incestuous, but kind of in a small way, but mm -hmm. really just proves how small of a world, um, this truly is. But I, again, it goes back to, I think networking is such a vital piece to growing a business and mm -hmm. a brand. And I don't know if people know how to adequately do that yeah. as effectively as they, they could. Well, I think part of it is um, just an attitude of giving mm -hmm. coming from that, from first, not, not, not everything has to be transactional. I'm Agreed. doing this for you. Yep. I'm making the introduction. I think you two could do something, yep. could be valuable. You know, the Jamana introduction, they're one, uh, they are our largest LP in the yep. fund. So that yep. was huge and just comes through, you know, Hey, I met someone on the soccer field um, yep. and uh, I had five children. They're all 30 and 40 uh, now, but the, um, uh, I spent a lot of time in the bleachers in the baseball field, although right. I never ran across any LPs. I, yeah. I, I should have had him play soccer, apparently. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I'm basically investing in people from just a, just from the heart, you yeah. know, and uh, doing uh, favors and, um, you know, the tide raises all boats, right? And yeah, I agree with you. I think it's, it's, it's way beyond just raising money, right? Mm -hmm. I think the, the human capital side of, uh, entrepreneurial ship and just that world is just as important mm -hmm. as, as money. Right. Um, you know, it's, in my opinion, it's, it's more valuable because, you know, Billy was, you know, I never even actually asked him for help. He mm -hmm. actually just volunteered his himself mm -hmm. and his time, um, <clears throat> excuse me, to, to help me raise that initial friends and family round which I had no idea. I mean, he helped structure the deals. So he did all of that, right? And I just sat back and I went, Billy's advising me. Just mm -hmm. I let him, you know, deal with it. And when I uh, when he told me that he was working uh, and leading the Soft Tech Venture Fund, I thought, okay, well, here's my chance to help him now, mm -hmm. right? And and I don't, I had n at not one point even today have I ever thought to myself, gosh, I wish I would have put something down on paper. For that. <laughs> right. No, I think it's, it's great that these relationships have really cultivated into something real and genuine. Mm -hmm. And, you know, all that stuff comes back to you, right? I mean, it's not always about, like you said, it's not always, it shouldn't always be transactional. Right. Yeah. I think sometimes even in the ecosystems and one thing that we're trying mm -hmm. to do with, um, 
you know, at, at Soft Deck with our venture studio and Metro Fund is trying to get the the community to collaborate. Yeah. Um, yeah. And bringing them together. And, you know, we, we've done events where we brought multiple, you know, SDOs, startup development organizations mm-hmm. like ourselves together. We did an event last year where we're benefiting Southern Smoke. I think yeah. that was something actually you might have even recommended a charity yeah. that yep. uh, benefited restaurants that were hard hit by COVID. Yep. But, you know, we had our startups there. We were... Um, and we put on, a, we kind of combined a 25th anniversary with a community event plus a fundraising for charity, and just you know, it was just really nice uh, to, to to do that and have it all come together in a positive way, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, because we're all we're all living and working in these communities, and yep. you know, how do you how do you give back? Yeah, um, and you're trying to improve the community too. I think yeah. at the same time, right? Exactly. That's part. That's part of the goal and the target. Right. Our mission at SoftTech is actually creating a better future with you. And um, one, uh, then that means three things to me. But the third piece is how do we create a better future in our own communities and our own backyards and helping out with charities and orphanages and donating time and um, and effort. Yeah, Um, I think that's so important. I mean, we I um, I'm so grateful for to have the opportunity that I have to build what I'm trying to achieve with with the business and. it, for me, it was, it's always been a mission to want to give back to the community that, that really opened their arms and embraced us. Mm-hmm. This kid that started the business out of his house, you know, the perception I had or the concern I had, I should say, is how, you know, what type of credibility am I going to have mm-hmm. with a, with a James Beard nominated or winning chef, um, where he's going to buy bread from this guy that's bakes out of it. That was at one point really a hobbyist. And mm. now all of a sudden he thinks he can cut it into this, into this space and into right. this world. And so, you know, I, because they were so literally inviting and welcomed it and loved the story and attached to that story. And then, you know, freely marketed unsolicited mm-hmm. my name on their menus to, to promote that they were sourcing from a local bakery and even one one customer went to as far as to just you know tell our story in a very mm. the shortened version of our story to to their staff. I mean, mm. not to the staff, but to, to everybody that sat at the table. I brought right. the bread service out, <laughs> which I thought was incredible. Um, and I thought, okay, I've got to figure out a way. Like, what can we do to give back? And mm-hmm. then I realized it's bread. Right. People need food. So, so we you know, had a little bit of imposter syndrome, right? A, l- a yeah. little bit, a little bit. But now we, you know, we donate bread every day to Kids Meals. Oh, example. damn. Yeah. At the schools or where, where do no, those go? Kids Meals is an organization that provides um, lunches, sack lunches for children in schools that can't afford lunches, mm. right? But our nice. bread, because of the style of bread it is, like they're not going to make a sandwich out of a sourdough for these kids. Right. But that bread that we donate every day goes home to those same kids' families. Mm. And, you know, for me, that was important because I know how to make bread because my parents couldn't afford the good bread. Right. Right. So I remember kids meals had brought out, I came to the facility and they told me a story about how one of these kids, um, after receiving their first loaf at their house asked, can we please get more of those, that rich people bread? Oh no. And I thought, oh my goodness. (laughs) Like, and that, that really hit me in a, in a various variety of different ways, but Mm -hmm. it just made me realize, okay, this is also part of the reason why you're doing this, mm-hmm. right? It's it's not just okay. Yes, the PNL and making sure that you're cash flow positive and <laughs> right. operations are in place, but it's like the without the community, you don't have a business, right? So let's make sure that you're taking care of the community at the same time. That's great. I really love that. Yeah. Kudos yeah. to you. Thank you. Mm-hmm. I appreciate that. And to you, I love what you guys are doing over there. Thanks. It's important work. <laughs> okay. What would you say to someone? like yourself, that was listening to the market when, when they feel like, well, maybe the market's oversaturated. How would you, how uh, you, would you recommend them to maybe test that hypothesis? I, I think, you know, there is, I think I do believe in that there is such a thing as over an oversaturated market, mm-hmm. but I, I still think there's always room for improvement. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the bakery business, for example, I mean, there's bakeries, there's multiple bakeries here in Houston, for example, that, that we all come, that I compete with on a daily basis. But, you know, for us, for example, I did the research to understand what were those bakeries not doing mm-hmm. and, and how, and how mm-hmm. can I fill those gaps? Mm-hmm. And that immediately launched us. And I think it's imperative for people to understand, you know, find, if you have a product or a solution, I, I advise them to, figure out how you can make someone's life better with it. 
Mm. What you, can you change about them in a positive way, whether it's technology driven or a consumer based good or whatever it is like, obviously everybody wants to create something that differentiates themselves from their competitor, whether it's saturated or not. Mm -hmm. And I think if you go in with a mindset of really analyzing it down to the minutia to understand where can you do it, but do it differently and better than the next guy. Right. And I think now the market's not so saturated because you found your niche. Talking to the people that are talking to the clients and the customers and hearing them. I remember there's a story um, about the founders from Airbnb and they, they were based in California. Right. right? And two founders, Brian Chesky and um, another guy that I forget at the <laughs> moment, but um, anyway, they, uh, they were talking to their VCs and the investor actually asked them, well, what, you know, they had gotten some early traction and they're like, well, where are your customers? And, and they said, well, it turns out that most of our customers right now are in New York city. And the investor said, well, why are you here? Why are you sitting here in California? Yeah. Get out there. And so what they figured out was they, um, they uh, started, they, they realized that one of the problems that the, that the Airbnb hosts had was that, you know, they didn't have like professional photos. And so they offered to take professional photos of their uh, apartments and houses that they're trying to rent. And it turned out to be Brian and his co-founder <laughs> and they'd go out there and they'd take the photos and then actually just hear from the host yeah. about what they liked, what they didn't like, what was working, what wasn't working. Yeah. And then they, they reacted to that, yeah. In that yeah. and they found their niche. I, I think, I think some business owners, uh, what they, what they should not do. And I've, I've seen this myself. They don't listen to their customers. Right. They they are of the mindset that well, I'm going to tell my customer what he wants and mm -hmm. needs, and my response is he'll never listen to you mm -hmm. because he knows what he wants better than you know what he wants. Right. It's a balance. I mean, some people would argue that the customer doesn't know what they want. You know, if Her if, if Henry Ford asked his customers what they wanted, they would have said faster horses, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So you kind of have to balance it. But, you know, there has to be some amount of conversation. And no, I think I, you can get yeah. some of these keys in the existing industries to understand yes. where you can offer yeah. a competitive product. Maybe it's not a completely innovative product. That's yeah. a different thing. People yeah. don't know yet whether they really, you know, what, what are they going to do with a, a mobile phone or whatever sure. it is, right? Sure. So um, it's pretty yeah. Interesting. No, yeah, I agree with you because like even now I, I've gotten relationships with chefs that they ask me what kind of bread should I use mm -hmm. for this type of application that I want to create? I want to do a menu change or something. Right. And that's where I think the balance can be very consultative, right? Mm -hmm. Just be like, well, I know what you want, but I want to hear your needs and I want to say, well, here's what, here's what you have. Here's what I think you should have. Let's mm -hmm. try to find a, a match in the middle somewhere. So right. yeah, I think that's great. Yeah. I agree with that. So how would someone connect with you if they're... You yeah. Know? So um, on all of our social, on all the social platforms, we're at Breadman Co, Breadman CO for Breadman Company or mm -hmm. Breadman Baking Company, but Breadman Co on Instagram, Twitter, uh, on Facebook, it's Breadman Baking Company. So facebook.com slash Breadman Baking. Mm -hmm. um, our website is Breadman Co. You can find the products at all your uh, area Whole Foods here in Houston. Mm -hmm. um, we're in about 165 restaurants across the, wow. the city. Mm. Um, we Are even, you outside Texas yet? Or? Yeah. Yeah. We have uh, customers in Denver, Arizona, Atlanta. Um, we're in Dallas as mm -hmm. well, which is inside of Texas. Yeah. To answer your question. Um, down the street in just, Texas terms. Yeah, yeah. down the street, <laughs> slightly up north by New York. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And anything next? For, what's next for Brenda? Yeah, we are in the process of launching a new retailer. Mm. Um, here, it, it'll start here in... Uh, in Houston, and we hope to grow it throughout the state. And it's a national grocery retailer. Mm, nice. Um, it starts with a K, mm -hmm. <laughs> if that makes any sense. Yeah, um, I can think of one. <laughs> yeah, and so we're getting ready to uh, to make an announcement that in the next 30 days or so. But mm. um, I'm excited about that relationship because that was in the works pre-COVID. Mm. And then when COVID hit, everything, you know, as you know, really kind of came paused. to a halt and yeah. paused for quite some time. So right. it's finally coming to fruition. So we're excited about that. That's great. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Yeah. I really appreciate it. Okay, Tassos, one of the things I like to do is uh, wear funny socks. So I have my, these are my version of Brandman socks. that has got a Benjamin on there, a hundred dollar like it. bell. It's bread, right? So yeah. Adventure is about bread. So I want to give you your own pair oh. of hundred dollar socks, Breadman awesome. socks. So Look at that. Uh, yeah, there you go. That and is enjoy. 
So cool. I'm going to wear these around the house. There you go. <laughs> so my kids can understand the value of the dollar. Yeah. Maybe, maybe bread man will become, have a new meaning now. I, I like this. Thank you. That's really awesome. Thanks yeah, so much. Sure. Oh, thank really you. Cool. Thank you.